So Seamus, have you ever worked someplace where they made you change your password regularly? No, interestingly enough. Uh, when I worked at Active World, our security systems were a joke, and I used the same password for like 17 years. <laughs> That's not even a joke. I've never worked anywhere for 17 years. Ah, uh, well, yeah, I started, I started with the company in 94. And uh, I never had to change. I was never obliged to change my password. I can't promise that I didn't maybe change it somewhere in the middle of that. But there was never like, hey, Seamus, it's been three years, change your password or anything. I don't. In fact, I know there was there wasn't even a system to track that. So th there was no way for anybody to know <laughs> when the last time you changed your password. But then, you know, this is in the rough and tumble early days of the internet and we were an early company no i i like to think nobody would be that irresponsible now well of the places that i've worked uh only one has ever made me change my password regularly and that was when we we're in aerospace so I, i'm assuming it was part of their iso 9001 certification or something right And at that point, I was like, okay, you're going to make me do this password thing. And I'm not just going to write it down like everyone else because that's irresponsible. So I printed out a whole block of just like random numbers and letters. And then I did a crossword thing where I would circle the the ones that I was using. But I'd also circle a bunch of the ones that I wasn't using. And so then I would just, if I forgot it, I would just remember which one I had circled instead of remembering the whole password. And that way, if anyone ever got my password block, they wouldn't know which one it was and they'd have to enter a whole bunch of them and I, I also randomized like what direction it was in if it was going like down or up or whatever so i don't know right. it probably wasn't very clever but i at least felt like i was achieving a little more security than most people who just like put it on a sticky note on their desk um i believe security experts say the best system is the name of your dog followed by an exclamation mark and then every time you're forced to change your password you get this Here's the tricky part. Add an exclamation mark. <laughs> I know. A lot of the guys did like something like that where it's like normal and then they'll just add like one, two, three, four, or whatever at the end. It's just like, oh, guys. Oh, please. This is not why they're making us change our passwords all the time. Right. <laughs> right. That, that sort of maximizes the, the threat. Well, or it maximizes the cross section you know, for attack, right? But it also just maximize. You know, the, you're going through this upheaval and doing all this busy work for no benefit. Yeah. Anyway, I the kids asked me to install Minecraft Windows 10 edition, and so for that they need my Microsoft account. And I was at work, and so I was like, oh, I'll just give them my Microsoft password no wait that would be a terrible decision okay instead i'll change my microsoft password let them give them that temporary one let them install minecraft or whatever and then i'll just change it back uh. and uh and so that was fine you know i changed my password you know sent it to them and they're like okay did the thing installed the thing okay you can change your password back and uh but on changing my password back and there's no there's nothing there saying like you must use x number of letters or numbers there's nothing saying you know because this is just like your microsoft account like whatever amount of security you want to use is fine right um so right. It, it doesn't have anything like don't make it the name of your dog or whatever it's just like just give us a password uh and so i i changed it back to the password that i had before because like that's the one I've always used for my Microsoft account, and I don't want to have to remember a new password. And Microsoft's like, no, you must use a new password for security. And I was like, ah, oh, swearing. I was, I was swearing in Microsoft. Like, you guys, this is no less secure than it was literally a half hour ago. Like, there's nothing is nothing has changed about the security situation. The only right. thing that's changed now is that you have decided that I am changing my password because I've detected a security risk and therefore I shouldn't 
change it back to the one that I had before. Like, what what makes you think that you have a handle on this situation? You're not you're not asking me to change my password all the time. You didn't tell me to change. I told you to change my password, and you sent me a two-factor authentication to make sure that I was me. And and I put I I put up with it, like because what else am I going to do? And then you're like, no, 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 you can't use the password you were using before. Come up with a new one. Like, really? Why? Why am I coming up with a new password? Maybe maybe you guys should come up with a new password system. One that doesn't assume that I'm an idiot. Right? It is so weird that you were dealing with this. Two days ago, I had a similar run-in with the same game. I got back into Minecraft. And I briefly ran into the confusion that if you want to run Windows 10 version, you have to log in with your Microsoft account. But if yeah. you want to run the Java edition, you've got to log in with your Mojang account. Right, right. And the kids were telling me this. They're like, but dad, it's logged in on this computer as this thing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's a, those are totally separate things. They're not the same at all. Right. And I couldn't, like, I've always, I had the password stored on my Minecraft manager. I've got, like, you know, a mod manager. And the password was stored. And I had to do something to switch to a new launcher or whatever, so it lost the password. And I realized, holy cow, this password has been saved so long it predates my password management system. And I've been using that oh, for years. Wow. Yeah. So this is a single install of Minecraft Java Edition that I've copied from, you know, one computer to the next just by dragging the directory. And it brought <laughs> it brought everything with it. And I've just been auto logging in for years. And I finally, you know, it was time to like type in the password and I didn't know it anymore so I had to actually you know update it change my password now it's in the password manager like like an adult yeah well at least they didn't ask you to change it because it was the same as it was before right right I just can't believe we both had to deal with that this week <laughs> that's kind of funny I mean I haven't touched Minecraft man. in yeah I haven't touched Minecraft in half a year the kids are always on it. They're they're on it continuously. And this, I I when I logged into Minecraft on my computer, I was logged into my Windows account, and so it gave me Minecraft Windows 10 Edition for free. But then the kids wanted to buy another copy of Windows 10 Edition so they could play together on Windows 10 Edition instead of on Java. Which I don't know why. I mean, all the mods are on Java Edition, but right. They, some about the Windows 10 thing they like, so whatever. It it's runs, their money. They spent their own money. Yeah. They bought their own copy. The Windows 10 edition runs real, real fast. I mean, you just load into the world. You, you know, the Java edition, you get into the world, and there's always stuttering, no matter how good your computer is. All the threads in Java getting in each other's ways. It staggers around interpreting code. Just like... And... Then you can see it adding chunks out, slowly crawling towards the horizon. Yeah. And it gets slower and slower, especially if you have a high draw distance. But you load in the Windows 10 version, and it's just like, boom. Now you can see all the way to the horizon. It takes like one second or two seconds. It is It is very nicely optimized. It is amazing. But yeah, you can't mod it. So like, why does it even exist? <laughs> well, you can pay for mods now. Why does it even exist? I re <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so speaking of seeing all the way to the horizon and view distance, uh, Steam popped up Dyson Sphere program on my my browser list or whatever they try to sell you things on. And I was like, wow, this looks really interesting. And then I noticed it was in the show notes. And so, have you played this? Is it good? Tell me about Dyson Sphere program. I'm not sure it's good. I okay, so it it feels kind of funny and cartoon. It, it it's it's pet peeve time. We're gonna before I answer your <laughs> oh, question, 
I have to go on a tangent. Already, before we have even established a direction, I am going on a tangent to that undefined direction. Um, one of my pet peeves... Now, I understand this game was made by... Oh, I forget the native language. I'm sorry, I've, I've forgotten it. I knew it two days ago when I was playing this. And then translated into English. But they used machine translation, not like deep learning, I'll just like, you know, Google Translate. And then they hired a voice actor to read those lines. Oh. It, Why didn't they have just... a machine voice language thing read the lines? Right? Why would you spend, especially this thing's in early access, you're going to change the tutorial many times, and this is hot garbage. Um, you know, all of this is going to change during development, and this translation is hot garbage that makes no sense. I mean, you can understand <laughs> the point, but, but it is definitely some mangled English. And so to hire a professional, good quality voice actor to read these lines to the player is... It's not just polishing a turd, it's having the turd painted. <laughs> Giving it an expensive coat of paint and putting a coat of gloss over it at great expense and maybe embossing it with gold leaf. Right. Oh, that's so funny. Like, it's... Oh, that's so weird. That is really, really weird. Why would they have voice acting in their early access game? Right. And especially at such an early stage. This game is very rough. Um, and it, it, the tutorial explained to me a bunch of stuff that was really obvious and I didn't need to know. But then there was one thing. It's like, how do you... Okay, think Factorio, but much, much simpler. You've got copper, you've okay. got iron. Like my industry kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're mining it, it throws on conveyor belts, and then from the conveyor belts it can go into machines. Um, in Factorio, you have grabber arms. This pro Dyson Sphere has some other thing, and it never explained that other thing. So I was just trying to connect the the conveyor belts directly to another building and it wouldn't work. Oh, like, sure. What? Like in Satisfactory. Right. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And it was like this, this one part that was never explained. You just had to like, oh, here's something I've never built before and build one attached to a building and then you understand its purpose. <laughs> but Funny. But, you know, it's like the, the voice acting explains the very obvious mechanics in broken English and then neglects the one thing that isn't obvious <laughs> and, right. and left me absolutely baffled for 10 minutes. Anyway, onto the game itself. It's very much Factorio, but it it seems to scale up. Like, you, imagine playing Factorio, but it's in 3D and you're playing on a sphere. Like, planets okay. feel really tiny. Well, yeah. Like, if, you know, cartoonishly tiny. You can see the curvature of the planet. It, it, it feels like um, yeah, Super yeah. Mario Odyssey, uh, not Odyssey, uh, Galaxy. Y you've seen those. Yeah, yeah. It feels yeah, like I, that. I, I played them. I beat them. Both. I did not know you were in a Nintendo guy. I, how long have we been doing this show together? And I never knew you, you were into uh, Mario. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm not. I, I've just, my parents have a, a Wii. And then my friends out in, um, that I went and visited some years ago have a Wii. And so it just so happens that both of them had the version one and two of Super Mario Galaxy. So I've played and beat them both. Okay. Well, um, one, your console filth, and you can't be on my podcast anymore. But two, I'm really glad you enjoy those games because they're gorgeous. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> right. No, no, ser seriously, that they are just. I, I've never enjoyed platformers because I'm just bad at them and I just can't. I can never get a feel for them. And I'm always like annoyed and frustrated. But. 
boy, is it like I've spent hours watching other people play Mario games on YouTube. They are just beautiful, beautiful games. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I have to say about Mario. Anyway, so that type of planetoid kind of deal, and just like Factorio, you've got iron, you've got copper, you, you know, put some mines down, harvest them onto conveyor belts, into secondary buildings to smelt them, then into tertiary buildings to start building them into different parts that you then combine, okay? With you, with you. Factorio all the way, and then I didn't get past that. There's some larger, the game is supposed to go larger scale. Like the whole point is you're going to build a Dyson Sphere, but you start off on a planet and then you expand and kind of, you know, expand all over the solar system. But I never got that far because I was just overcome by... Oh, this is just really, really simple Factorio. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I couldn't I couldn't get over that to get to the interesting stuff. Like I didn't want to sit here and play baby's first Factorio level for two hours before I got to the real game. So I kind of wandered off. Like in the game or from the game? Yeah, I, w I wandered off from the game. I just closed the game like... This is, hmm. this is probably going to get really good. I love the idea of building something incredibly massive, but I kind of don't want to play like 2D overhead simple Factorio for a couple hours before I get there. Yeah, it, it seemed, I, I watched the, the uh, videos on Steam and it seemed like it was starting too small. Like, the conceit of yeah. the game seems to be that it's like humanity's power needs are climbing, going through the roof. and But then you're starting off like as a as single robot, like mining power crystals or whatever. And it's like, well, hang on. Like, where's all the stuff that humanity has that's using all this power? And can I use some of those things, maybe? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it's too... It starts too small. I felt like, given the scale of where we're going, starting off in such a simple setup that's been done a thousand times better in other games is a bad way to lead off. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder, do, they, do you know if they have an end game yet, or are they just kind of building toward even being able to build a Dyson Sphere? I don't know, because I didn't get over that first initial hump. I'm actually curious. I, I should have looked it up on YouTube to see where the game goes. That might have gotten me curious enough to keep going. But, you know, I, you know, I was very bored by what was directly in front of me. And I wasn't sure if the <laughs> thing coming was going to be any good. So I didn't want to, like, risk it. And plus, I was still thinking about Minecraft. So I just went back to that. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, speaking of things that weren't good enough to keep someone playing, I played Per Aspera. And uh, it's interesting that Per Aspera is the beginning of the phrase that ends in Ad Astra, which is also a video game. Um, but Per Aspera means through hardship. And uh, that sums up this game for me. Oh, no. This sounds bad. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> so I... First off, I didn't uh, play all the way through, but I I have a friend who played all the way through, and so I talked to him about it and, like, end game and stuff. And so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the things that happened later on in the game, even though I didn't directly experience them. Um, but the the first thing... Oh, so, so overview, Per Aspera is a Mars colonization simulation kind of game. Um, and that's cool. And it's got, like, a, an accurate Mars map and uh it's you can zoom way Ooh. in and zoom way out and uh it's it's cool it, it looks really good and uh the technology is fine it's built on unity so it's it works it's not super stable i think it crashed once for me but uh you know it's, it's all right 
Okay. Um, my main gripes with it, though, are that it's, uh, well, okay, so first off, it's unrealistic. Like, you land on Mars, and there are all these resource nodes that you have to go and build mines on. Um, and, okay, fair enough. Like, there's concentration of minerals on Mars. But one of the resource mines that you have to build is an iron, there's like an iron deposit or whatever. And uh, I don't know how much our audience knows about iron on Mars, but I'm assuming that you know why Mars is red. It's because all of the iron is converted to rust. Yeah, yeah, Mars is just like a giant ball of rust. So, like, there's no... Oxidized. Like, what do you mean? I, I, what, yeah, oxidized. yeah. Oxidized. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the how, word I was looking for. Yeah, and so, like, how do you get oxygen for your colony? How do you get iron for your colony? Just pick up a hunk of ground and you're done. You heat it up and it, it all drives the oxygen off and you've got some iron. Like, it's not hard. It's, is that... Is that how it works in real life i mean really that that works yeah you just heat it up hot enough in the in the oxygen debonds from the iron i thought that was a, a vacuum one -way trip. trip no it's just huh. chemistry anyway so so there's like this iron deposit and it's just like really like you and it's supposed to be like in the in the difficulty settings it's like you know got easy and medium and hard and on the hard ones like this is exactly like how it would be to colonize mars it doesn't say that exactly but it's, that's the impression they're giving they're they're trying to give right. this experience of like this is how it would really be and so i was like no like you lost me at, at the beginning of the tutorial like iron deposit on mars no i don't think so it's all um yeah it, literally all you need is dirt because yeah. the dirt and like, is maybe iron. have an iron refinery. Sure, fine. Like I can buy that. But like not an iron deposit. And these iron deposits run out. Like there was another thing. All these deposits <laughs> get depleted. But like you're working over these huge areas of Mars and you're not building a Dyson sphere. You're just like building a little colony. So like over the course of the period that you're doing this game, it may be several years. Like, you're depleting these resource nodes. So it's like, oh, you just used up all the iron on Mars here. You got to go somewhere else on Mars to get more iron. I mean, and ugh, it was just so, it was so unrealistic that it completely broke my my immersion in the game. Uh, so, like, resource nodes having iron and depletion uh, were two things that were just like, like, even on real life Earth, where we've got millions and billions of people and huge industry there are spots on our planet where we still have mines that have been there for hundreds of years they're still pulling minerals out of the ground they're not depleted we've been doing an industrial scale huge amounts tons and tons and tons of this stuff and it's not like we ran out like it was this weird i'll get to it later like the environmentalism kind of stuff that that i felt was kind of entangled in the game but anyway Iron deposits, depletion. They also had um, some weird stuff, like there's no recycling. Like you you have uh, water deposit, which fair enough, okay, you need to extract water. But then once you've got it in your colony, like you should never need to add more water to the colony. It's not like they're just dumping it in a septic system and letting it drain out into the Martian sand. <laughs> like they're going to recycle this stuff. It's going to be a closed system life support for a long time until you've actually terraformed Mars. The, the objective so, is to terraform wait. Mars and make it Earth-like or whatever. So, the iron deposit thing, you could fix that by saying, like, okay, you need an iron extractor, and, oh, the ground is only solid enough to hold it in these areas. So, you could have the same thing if you want to force the player to build right here. Oh, you know, it's civil engineering. You, you can only build in these spots. And th Yeah, sure. You could, if you need that from a gameplay experience, perspective you don't have to have an iron deposit what you really need is just a way to force the player to build in different spots yeah so they don't well, just and, like and to be fair they have the other resources cube. yeah they, well they've yeah. got they've got uh, aluminum and they've got um carbon and so there's like all these different kind of deposits and like Sure, aluminum, you know, Mars isn't known for having aluminum just kind of like all all over the place or, or carbon just right. everywhere. So, like, fair enough. Those deposits 
I can I can buy that. But just the the idea of limited iron deposits, and you're always running out of iron because you use it for everything. And so it's just like, and then I'm depleting all these iron deposits, and I was just like, no, no, guys, like if there's one thing you you have enough of on Mars, it's iron. Right. The water um, might be So tricky. anyway, yeah, no recycling. They don't recycle any of the water. Uh, you don't recycle any of the aluminum. Like aluminum, even on Earth, where where we've got mines all over the place and it's easy to just dig stuff up, we recycle like 97% of all our aluminum or something. It's really easy to recycle. And it's just, there was no, there's no mechanism for recycling anything. If you want to tear something down, it's just gone. You know, you want to, you're building drones all the time with aluminum. That was another thing. There's all these drones that are flying around. But like, I don't know if there's anything about Mars besides iron that's well known, but if there is, it's that its atmosphere is so, so super thin. Like, it's not a vacuum, right. but it's like a right. thousand times less dense than Earth's atmosphere. And so you're not going to have flying drones flying around, like, not for commercial purposes, not in any way that makes sense. Maybe for surveying something, you've got like a little tiny super light one with a tiny little camera, but these are like drones for doing maintenance. And that was another thing, like, Anyway, I'll get I'll get to that. But they had drones. They had whole airships. They're flying these airships around. And like for comparison, a thousand times less dense is a, as as the density comparison between air and water. Like so, if you think of like a giant old cargo boat, and then being like, well, why don't we just fly them around in airships? It's like, well, no, because that doesn't make any sense. Because the displacement is has to be a thousand times bigger. So if you just take that comparison and be like, well, okay, well. We can use airships on Earth. We use them all the time for flying people around. No, we don't actually. But why don't we just use them on Mars? Well, because it would be a thousand times harder. You crazy people. <laughs> like, why would you put this in your game? And I understand. It looks cool. And it's like all futuristic to have these airships flying around Mars. But if you're trying to make this a realistic game, then you can't just be throwing all this stuff that looks cool in. Like, pick your, pick your genre. Are you doing... Gal galactic space opera or are you doing like realistic mars sim and they were selling th it presents itself as like a science-based sim and it's obviously using starcraft sort of style logic <laughs> right yeah 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 you've got your and little resource extractors and yeah. yeah yeah right right yeah i i have no problem with airships I have no problem with realistic Mars sims. It's when you try to put your your airships in the Mars sim that it's just, I'm not buying it. So unrealistic was the first thing. Then it was also fiddly on top of that. It was frustrating to use. Um, the interface is really slimmed down and, and streamlined. It, you're playing as an AI. So it's supposed to be all like computery and stuff. Uh, and you know, like really clean, because I guess that's what AIs are like. They have like really clean interfaces or something. I don't know. I've never been an AI, but apparently they think that's what it's like. But like, I want to be able to like do stuff. This is a game that I'm playing. It's not just presentation. Um, it was fiddly to place things. Uh, there wasn't enough snapping and, and stuff. Uh, there wasn't any visible hotkeys. Like they don't, you, when you hover over a thing, it doesn't tell you the hotkey for it. There were hotkeys, but they were all hidden in the, you got to go into the options menu and like for changing the hotkeys. And then it's like, oh, here they are. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, a lot of the interface was zoom based. So like you zoom in to get to a thing and then you zoom way out to get to the orbital view to like do your research or do your special projects or something. And it's cool that you can zoom all the way in and out and it's seamless and stuff. But like when I want to go to my special projects, I want to be able to just hit a key. And to be fair, there is a key that you can hit, but they never tell you about it. And uh, so like I spent most of my playthrough like zooming in and out on the scroll wheel, which is not a, a fun interface experience. It's, it's frustrating. Right. Um, yeah. There were no bookmarks on the planet. Uh, you couldn't like go from one place to another and like bookmark it so you could get back there easily. And as you're building this thing, you get tons and tons and tons of these little tiny buildings. You're not building like whole zones. You're building each individual building all over the place. And so it ends up being very expansive and it would be really nice to have some way to bookmark things and like quickly go back. And if I recall, like RTSs have been doing this for ever like <laughs> since, since the 90s warcraft one before it was even one it was just warcraft you had hotkeys for going to bookmarks locations so this, this isn't new technology guys um there wasn't any way to cancel building roads or updating roads um just roads in general okay so there was one cool thing about roads when you build a building 
uh, it has to be within a certain radius of another building and then when and then it connects those buildings with roads and it's got this really cool thing where it like makes this branch tree kind of structure kind of like lightning with all the dendrites going out in all directions and then it finally finds a path and then it builds a road connecting those two and it's like that's really cool i don't have to draw the roads manually it does it for me um but it would be really nice if i could just say like build a whole string of buildings because i don't actually care about this building i care about getting a road way over there and it'd be nice to be able to just like click and drag a whole road or a whole string of buildings of roads or whatever. And there's no way to do that. It doesn't it doesn't have that capacity. Um, and then roads also like roads. You can't just build roads on their own. They're always connecting buildings. And so if you tear down a building, it also tears the roads down that are connecting those buildings. So don't ever do that. <laughs> um, and then if you're when you're exploring, like when you're doing a, a survey or whatever, you can find resource nodes and sometimes if you haven't explored the area and you've like built a roadway out into the middle of it so that maybe because you wanted to build an exploration station way out in the middle of nowhere so it could explore more efficiently and then it's going to start exploring and it's like oh well there's this resource node that's like right next to one of the things you already built to get here and now you can't build anything on that you can't build an extractor on it because Mars may be completely uninhabited, totally open for your construction needs, but these two buildings on the map that are like a thousand times bigger than they are in real life are too close to each other. And you just, you can't build things that close together on Mars. There's some sort of zoning regulation or something. I don't know. Uh, so that was really <laughs> annoying too. And also like because they want you to kind of spread out and make this giant planet spanning thing, all the buildings have limits on how close you can place them together so you can't like just build a base like a whole city on mars um you have to build them like spread out a, a little bit from each other so that all of those fancy 3d model icons can like fit on the planet without overlapping and but that just doesn't make any sense either and also makes your cities really sprawly and that leads to more problems with roads and then you want to move buildings around but when you destroy the buildings then the roads go away and now you can't get your little robots over there to build the things that you wanted to build because you were trying to build something you weren't trying to mess around with this stupid auto road system um and then once you've built and torn down enough buildings you run out of iron and now you're in a resource soft lock because you can't build any more structures to get to the more iron deposits that you need because apparently you ran out of iron on Mars. So that's the frustrating part. Then it's also inflexible. So like you could build a, a robot or something out of aluminum, sure. And, and it's a drone, so it needs to be light because Mars atmosphere, ah, okay. But why couldn't you build a robot with iron or or with carbon fiber or something like this is a super advanced AI constructor thing like but no there's only one kind of resource for each thing that you're building that you can use it's not like you can build bricks out of regolith or iron beams or aluminum beams you can't build your buildings out of aluminum it has to be out of iron and you can't build your habs out of iron it has to be out of machine parts or whatever it's it's, it's not flexible at all and not only is it resource inflexible it is also like purpose inflexible so when you start getting colonists at first you start off with just robots but then you get colonists but the colonists can't build anything they can't do maintenance they can't do anything except for research so and like that's one of the things that humans are really good at is like being flexible and doing lots of different things we can work on stuff and we can go and, and build stuff and we can dr drag power lines around and like we can do a lot of different things, but like in this game, there's only one thing that each thing does. And like your building robots can't work on uh, repairing things and your repairing robots can't work on building things. It's like everything is single purpose. All the resources are single purpose. Um, and then this even extends to, so in the storyline, I'm gonna do a bit of spoilers for Perospera. Uh, early in the game, you discover a this old story outpost. Line? Oh yeah, oh, oh, we haven't even, so that's that's point number four. We'll get there. But on on the way to getting there, this is one of the single purpose things. You end up having access to, to some nukes, um, but you can't use the nukes for anything except for mol melting the polar ice. And so uh, you can't use them for attacking the enemies that also show up eventually. Uh, you can't use them for digging holes. You can't use them for extracting uh, resources. You can't use them for changing the landscape. Uh, you can't use them for anything except for this one thing that, like, 
it, okay, fair enough. That would be kind of cool to melt the polar ice with nukes, but like, really? Nukes aren't useful? You can't like extract the nuclear material from them and, and turn them into nuclear reactors? That would be a cool thing. There are even nuclear reactors in the game. You can't just like take them apart and research nuclear reactors. And another thing, you have to research all your technology. Like they sent this super advanced AI to Mars so that it could start building this base. And then they're like, no, we're not going to share any of our, our plans with you. Come up with your own. <laughs> I was like, really? Why? Why would you do? Why would you hamstring yourself that way? And so you have to send people to Mars in order to figure out how to pave roads. And I'm not making this up. They won't tell you how to pave your roads. You have to make them out of dirt until you can send a whole bunch of people there with their little beakers or whatever they're doing and to figure out like how does asphalt even like why why would you do that like is this how you think that people are going to terraform mars they there's like physics works different on mars who knows how asphalt will behave what strange properties of all these materials will we discover on mars like no no that's not how any of this works like engineering works everywhere which is why it's so powerful so like uh and then on top of that all like so this is not a very good base building game. It's not a very good real-time strategy game. It's not very good of any of that stuff. But it's not really about any of those things because really, this is a story game. It's fully voiced. It's got multiple characters. Oh. There are multiple path threads. You can make decisions. It's this whole, like, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure Mars sim game. Um but the problem with that is that there's all this environmentalism that got woven into the game. Now, I'm not saying anything about Earth environmentalism. Like, environmental problems on Earth are are problematic. There's a very complex ecosystem, and if things go wrong, they can go wrong very badly. But on Mars, there is not a complex ecosystem, and if things go wrong, they can only go wrong in a way that's better for terraforming Mars because it's not going to get any colder <laughs> or more dead. So, like... <laughs> Say there's some sort of release of all this bioactive whatever, and there's like some sort of algal bloom. Great! Say there's a release of some sort of terrible, like, they've even got a factory that creates HFCs so that you can, like, build up global warming on Mars. So it's like, all of these things are not a problem on Mars, but there's all this environmentalism of like, oh, but how are we going to make sure that we're not harming the planet? And like, oh, if you use nukes, maybe it'll harm the planet of Mars. And like, oh, it, it would be harmful and it would be it would be irresponsible of us to terraform Mars. Like, that's what you're all, that's why you're here. That's what we're doing. But that's what we're trying to do. If, if you think the disturbing Mars is bad then you shouldn't have founded a colony there <laughs> right and like you shouldn't have sent a hyper advanced ai whose entire directive is to completely overthrow the entire environment and make it totally different from what it is right now like did is that what you wanted or not because you should have thought of that before you pushed that button Oh, that is silly and annoying that they did it with a big fancy story. Uh, you know, city building games, city or environment, you know, factory building games do better with no story or minimalist story. Yeah, I can only imagine how cringy it would be if city skylines had a character to pop up every few minutes and have a conversation with another character about how they think the city's doing yeah well and, and it's your character and to be fair they're they're trying to do something interesting with ai so you're playing an ai character and the people who call you up are like the base commander and the person who programmed you or was in charge of your your programming or whatever and uh, the mission commander and stuff and so they're all like talking to you and it's it's a way to do a tutorial which is like okay i understand but it doesn't do anything interesting with it. It doesn't do anything interesting with exploring like how an AI behaves or what its motivations are or what kind of ways it would see the world that are different from the way that a person, like a, a biological person, if we're going to say that they're actually humans or, or people or whatever, like it doesn't do any of that. It's just like, decide if you feel or think. Decide if emotion is more important than reason. Decide if you want to nuke the poles or spread black coal dust on the poles. And like, 
I don't know. I didn't get far enough to see anything uh, about the end game and how it addressed that, but my friend who played the game said that that pattern continues and, and it basically doesn't really do anything with exploring the AI aspect of the game, which was the Ooh. only thing about the story that was remotely interesting to me and I imagine also to you and by extension to almost everyone who listens to this podcast. So, per espera, give it a pass, uh, thank you, and good night. So, would you say you liked it or not? Yeah, game of the year. <laughs> that, that is so irritating. That Especially, I, I was like, okay, I can deal with this, I can deal with this. And then we got to story, cutscenes, people talking, and I'm like, no, no. Like, it seems like a game like this ought to lean into sort of a Dwarf Fortress kind of energy. Yeah, you know, yeah, it could have been like so. It could have been so the good story could if be its systems emergent. were good. But like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they were trying to do. It seems like they were trying to make this like story game about AI and Mars, and then they're like, "But what is the gameplay? I guess we'll have to build some sort of city building thing." And I don't know. It just it, it all went wrong. It all went wrong. How did it go so wrong? Let's do some mailbags. What do you say? Yeah, please, anything. All right. I don't remember this one. I read it like a week ago, but the title is Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, so I like this already. Dear Diecast, you seem to like discussing temp contemporary topics, so here's one for you. Have you heard of an old 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up game by Capcom ugh, called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs? I have not. It was all the rage in certain arcades back in the 90s. Oh, yeah, I didn't really do arcades in the 90s. Um, and it's still a blast to play today, owing to the very sweet soundtrack and a fluid combat system. How about a 20-year-old fighting game called Oni, or Oni, I never figured out which way you're supposed to pronounce it, made by Bungie West. Also a fl fluid-feeling combat system with an excellent soundtrack, voice acting, and some interesting story ideas. I'm not much of a fighting fan, and I would find the complexities of moves, counter moves, and whatnot in, in Mortal Kombat 11 off-putting, but I keep wondering sometimes where to find fighting games like the above. Easy to learn, hard to master, and very enjoyable to try, try out without a wealth of genre knowledge needed. Thank you, Galad. So, I played Oni, or Oni, back in the day. Mm. Um... I remember really hating it because it was just endless box rooms. Like, oh, the the environment design was numbing to me. Like, I'd actually get, you know, you're in a perfect subtracted cube room. You go down a subtracted cube corridor into another subtracted cube room. And it's just, you know, a big empty space with some crates and a bunch of dudes to fight. And, oh, wow. I, I got angry because this was late. I believe it came out early aughts. But we just came off the, the late 90s and we had games like Unreal and... Um, you know, quite, level design was getting really sophisticated. They were building some really gorgeous, complex levels with, you know, interesting feel. And then to go to this game, which felt like it could have been rendered in Wolfenstein almost. Um, the environments made me so angry. And that's all I remember 20 years later. So it was just kind of working your expectations back down for Mass Effect. <laughs> but I've never heard of Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Um, it's weird. I've never heard of it, but I kind of, you know, I played, I spent a lot of time in arcades in the 80s and in the very early 90s. But then I, you know, once I got a real job, I just sort of missed all of video gaming from, you know, 94 to 2000. Just poof, vanished into a black hole. I was too busy making babies and writing code. Important things. Right. 
I didn't. I, uh, a little. I looked up lesson. Cadillacs and dinosaurs. Oh, hmm? oh okay. Oh, I was just going to say a little life lesson. I did not realize how awesome that part of my life was until I looked back on it. I was like, I should have been happy all the time. That was amazing. Uh, make yeah. awesome code and make people. These are two. <laughs> these are two very rewarding endeavors. I'm sorry. Go go ahead. Cadillacs and dinosaurs. Yeah, I well, so I I looked up Cadillacs and dinosaurs, and it looks super. 80s 90s uh and today greatest hits kind of thing it's just very uh, like like teen boy fantasy world I, I read up on the wikipedia and uh there's there's multiple properties in this in this sub genre of cadillacs and dinosaurs there's like there's the anime and there's the comic book and there's the arcade game, and there's the video game, and there's the novelization, and it's just it goes on and on. And it's one of those one of those tiny little uh, cult hits, I guess, that that just produces all these these little spinoffs. But uh, the the conceit, the central conceit, is like apocalypse, humanity goes underground, and for whatever reason, uh, like mechanics are the new. Uh, cool guys and so and there's this super cool mechanic that only works on cadillacs even though they don't exist anymore and it, they're almost impossible to find and so it's just like cadillacs driving away from dinosaurs chasing them because dinosaurs rule the earth now for some reason and what do they eat no one knows that makes perfect sense and i have no questions thank you science man So, so uh, I, I, yeah, I looked up the, some screenshots and I see it is very much a Street Fighter. Like the artwork looks so much like Street Fighter. Like what if Street Fighter but on drugs? <laughs> right. What if Street? Yeah. What if Street Fighter but out of its damn mind? It's so crazy. I mean, I love it. I I grew up with like the whatever the GI Joes uh, with the dinosaurs with the like laser guns sticking out of the dinosaurs kind of thing, you know, like the stuff that oh, Axe Cop Dino, is always making fun of. Dino bots or something. What was that? I remember it was those like before Dino bots. I just remember like going into the thrift store and finding like the big plastic dinosaur with like the base built on its back that's got like big old laser turrets sticking out of it like some sort of demented battleship and right. I was just I was so happy it is it is really cool and has a sense of fun about it like you would not see something like this today except as a weird indie title triple a does not is not this creative anymore triple a hasn't been this creative in 20 years and it does kind of have that muscle cars and girls in tight tops uh, kind of um, objectification thing going on, I guess, which people are uncomfortable with today. But like, hey, there's a there's a niche for that, and and good for on for them for filling in. Right, right, yeah. I mean, I I know it's a little weird by today's standards, but hey, it it's harmless. It's and uh, harmless. yeah, the music is is pretty pretty catchy. I have not heard the music. I'm not going to play that while we're recording. But that's really cool. All right, I'm going to read the next one. Do it. Dear Diecast, Rebrowsing the site, I noticed Seamus talking a lot about anime almost two decades ago. Time sure flies by at light speed, but almost nothing about it during the 2010s. I'm interested in Seamus and Paul's thoughts on the medium and if they've seen any anime in the present day. I'm also curious in knowing if Seamus has seen Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, considering how he made multiple posts about how he enjoyed the original in 2003 series, but thought that it was padded and stretched by the end, which I feel that FMAB addressed by making more coherent and tighter series with a clearer beginning, middle, and end. Because it adapted the entire manga, whereas the original 2003 series had to make up original storylines because the source material was far from over when it was still being produced, this sentence was way too long, I'm sorry, but I, Paul, added that thing about being sorry about the long sentence, and I'm not going to read your name. You know who you are. And you know what you did. <laughs> so, for me, 
I loved anime because it was so fresh and so different and so novel. But then I spent a few years watching anime and then it wasn't fresh and novel and different anymore. It was just another kind of media to, to consume. And, you know, you get, you get right. used to, oh, oh, this, okay, this guy seems super evil now and he just beat up the main character, but they're going to be best friends in two episodes. Like, I can totally see where <laughs> yeah. this is going. Right, right. And, oh, it starts off where they're all friends, but you just know there's going to be a school competition where they're all going to have to team up against each other to figure out who's the best. Oh, she's wearing that tight top. Somebody's going to fall face first. Yep, the main character just fell face first into her boobs, and now he's now he has a nosebleed, is embarrassed, and everybody's laughing at him. Yeah, yeah. It, um, having spent some time in Japan there is a very strong conventional uh, current in Japanese culture where like, this is how things are done. This is the way that we do them. We're all doing it this way. You can be on board or you can just piss off. And so uh, I think that that runs through their, their media as well. And it's kind of weird that they're like their mangaka or whatever, they're seen as these total outsiders. They're totally off the handle and like crazy creative people. And they're who knows what they're going to do next. Um, but they are very much a product of their culture as well, where like Japanese culture expects you to produce story beats A, B, and C. And like, if you don't produce those story beats, no one is going to buy your product. And so the ones who don't, don't ever make any more product and the people who do are successful and get exported overseas. So we end up with a very, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having conventional genre beats. And of course, the West has them too, which is why it was so refreshing to meet them in anime. But yeah, I also found that uh, after a while, you could be like, okay, is this going to be like a growing up school thing? Is this going to be slice of life thing? Or is this going to be like an uh, evil demon supernatural thing? And like, that's those are your options. So when you were in Japan... Um, was it as often as they show it in the anime where it's like every day you're falling face first into boobs or accidentally grabbing boobs? Or was that just like once a week kind of thing? Well, uh, I was married at the time. And so, yeah, it was totally like that. <laughs> All right, then. But yeah, no, not unlike strangers on the street. And there were zero women at, I was working at a, a big industrial factory and I, I'm, I'm almost certain that there were zero women there, like, at all. Um, Japanese culture is much more chauvinistic than, than, than the West, so it was just like, well, no, they're, they're off somewhere else. Th I, I, I guess at least half of them were probably women pretending to be boys for convoluted reasons that are absolutely unbelievable, <laughs> and somehow right. nobody around them ever figured it out. That, that's what I assume is the case. Yeah, well, and the other half of them were transforming into magical girls to feed, defend us from horrors from beyond the stars all the time, which we couldn't right. see because we're just normies and are oblivious to all this. Right. What an interesting country. I love learning about their culture. <laughs> Speaking uh, of anime... They, they, they look at us through the lens of Michael Bay movies, so it's only fair. I, I yeah I would okay be, so there is uh, there is an interesting um, thing that that kind of relates to all the boobies uh, in in the United States uh, women showing their legs is kind of considered like risque right like short skirts and stuff is like oh I don't know about that um, but showing no or is it the other way around I forget anyway so, but like um, in Japan wearing short skirts is is not at all uh, unbecoming. It's just like, well, that's fine. You know, like you can do that. But uh, women showing their bust in any way is like, whoa, whoa, like off limits. And so uh, anime often plays with those, um, what, not stereotypes, but um, conventions. There's a word for it. Um, Tropes. Norms. I can't think of it. Everyone's going to mention in the comments, I'm going to feel dumb. I already feel dumb. Anyway, um, so they play with that over like, you know, 
interacting with breasts is like way off limits. It would be like, uh, you know, groping a girl's crotch or something. It's like very, very, for us in the West, it's like very, very off limits. Um, and it's just a different, it's just a different um, uh, taboo. That's the word, taboo. It's a different taboo in, in Japan. And so uh, that's why often like American girls in in these shows are shown in like bikinis or whatever, where they've got like their boobs hanging out because just like Western women, oh, they just don't care at yeah. all about this stuff. Right, right. That's how they that's how it is with them over there in America. She's just being it's like when we have a Japanese person running around America with a kimono. They, they'll have some American <laughs> right. woman with with her tits hanging out. That's that's traditional yep. American garb. Yeah, yeah, and a giant mouth. Because like in Japan, you're supposed to cover your mouth if you open, like if you yawn or if you laugh or whatever. You're supposed right. to cover your mouth. And in the in the in the West, of course, like everyone's just like rah 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 with their mouths hanging open. Check out my tonsils. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely a different culture. Um, but in short, no, I haven't watched very much anime uh, recently. Same. Yeah, I once I learned the patterns, um, then it was just... I don't know. I didn't really lose interest. I guess I lost interest in watching media in general once my job was playing video games and it's like well i'd rather play a video game anyway right and uh anime watching was something i did with my wife and now we um like watch british baking shows and stuff like that together so yeah there really isn't place in my life for anime i don't dislike it and I'd probably rather watch that than a lot of American media. But, yeah, I'm just busy with other hobbies. It's not like you're just consuming sitcoms all the time. Right. Yeah, I'm not sitting here watching Big Bang Theory going, Haha, anime sucks. Right. All right. Speaking of boobies... Speaking of Japanese-styled boobies, Dear Diecast, I remember Seamus being very fond of Honey Pop, and I just saw that Honey Pop 2's release date is announced on the 8th of February, so I wondered if Seamus has already freed his schedule. With kind regards, Chris. So it is true that I really love that game, and I get in the mood to play it once in a while. And just, I love this sort of slow pace, like match three solitaire, kind of, you know, the pace of solitaire, but the, the kinesthetic, the, the gameplay of match three, which you do not get in any other match three game. Everything else is just like click on stuff like crazy and sparkles and particle effects and wow, sound effects just just this complete fireworks overload in your face all the time and honey pop is very slow paced <laughs> right right and, and you know you just randomly click on something and the board just clears itself and you know plays a great fanfare at what a brilliant player you are and i so i really love the gameplay of honey pop but wow the the sexual aspect of the game made me super uncomfortable and part of it is just like i don't play sexy games that's kind of not my thing i i kind of find them vaguely embarrassing and then the other thing is just all oh, the girls look so young i mean yes everyone is 18. you know that that common thing where uh, that, that's another difference between japan and the united states over here it is super taboo to be sexualizing um girls in their mid-teens but apparently that's much less scandalous in japan so when stuff gets imported from japan they're like yeah this girl she's totally 18 this obviously 16 year old or 15 year old girl yeah she's totally 21 shut up stop asking <laughs> right she's drinking beer and stuff racist? It, but it's fine she's uh she's 18 to 21 whatever it is whatever you americans care about just give us a number right. we'll, we'll put it on there whatever's a 
whatever's appropriate to you. And you're like, she doesn't look at what? That's how Japanese women look. You racist. Stop asking. <laughs> That's right. You racist. <laughs> um, so I looked up Honey to I did not know anything about this. And I was like, I wonder if the second game, maybe it'll be milder. You know, maybe it's going to lean towards more mainstream. And there'll just be a pretty girl talking to you while you're playing this game. And I'm like, like maybe they'll like that. reel back that primary selling point of the game. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. Yes, I know it was a foolish thought, but I thought it anyway. <laughs> so I looked up, the second game is called Double Date. And you date two girls at once, and there's one on each side of the board. Hmm. And your job is to make them both happy at once. So, so happy. So I think I think I got to give this one a pass. I I'm still waiting. Years ago, I was like, somebody really needs to make a non-sexy version of this game, and uh, that still hasn't happened. That's still like all the ma all the other match three games are just absolutely empty. Um, just click fests, Skinner boxes without the box. Yep. Right? Skinner piles. <laughs> Skinner fireworks. Just brush your phone screen lightly. Um, or shake your phone. Or do anything to indicate you might be looking at the screen. And it'll just throw particle effects and tell you how talented you are. So... I'm still waiting for somebody to give me. And the, the other thing, the other thing about Honey Pop is its production values were through the roof. Uh, the the music was incredible. The environments looked were really well drawn. And um, if you have Steam showing adult titles, you'll see that a lot of the sexy games are not the highest class art. Like, this is obviously somebody who's still learning the ropes and has just got one of those great big how-to-draw-manga books and they're working their way through it. And they decided to turn their their sort of early <laughs> they, work into not a even, video game. They're not even working their way through it. They just turn straight to the boobies section and they're like, how, right. how do I do this part? A girl with a three-inch waist and and, you know quintuple D knockers or whatever the upper limit of, of knocker size is. Like somebody who would physically not be able to stand or operate as a human being. But Seamus, she's a result of a genetic experiment in making the super soldier. <laughs> super soldier. It's like, whoops. I'm sorry, sir. I know you wanted a super soldier. We accidentally made a super stripper. It was a typo. I'm sorry. It was autocorrect. Well, at least she'll um, be good at working in electrical systems. Right. So, and, and I, I'm not, I'm not trying to bash those games. I'm just trying to lift up Honey Pop by saying its drawings were very high quality. They would pass for you know big budget anime release. You know, this is good enough to that. You know, it could be in a mainstream anime title if yeah, there is yeah. such a thing. Yeah, Honey Pop is a classy lady. <laughs> right. But it's... She's too racy for me. I, this is not my speed. I'm, I'm way too old and too boring to, to get into that kind of sexy time energy. So, no, I will be giving Honey Pop 2 a pass. But someone, please, please... Put that game, put that gameplay in something without anime tits. I'm not condemning your anime tits. By all means, enjoy. You know, the market wants what it wants, and you deserve to get it. If you're willing to pay for it, you deserve to have it. But, uh, but it's it's not my thing. Well, another game for the needs a clothes mod pile. <laughs> clothes mod. 
All right. Paul, I think we've done a show. There's still mails in the mailbag this week. Good job, everybody. Thanks for to everyone who wrote in. If you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. That's it. Say goodbye, Paul. You must use a new ending. next year oh wait we can't you know what screw it see you next year everybody <laughs> just reuse that one but it's for security Seamus it's for security